Big D, I just had a thought. You're trying to raise three thousand dollars. You got a truck full of lobster. Fucking lobster. Sell yeah. the fucking lobster. Sell lobster the truck. Rolls. Sell the truck. You Sell the Ferrari. <laughs> Sell the rocket launcher. <laughs> yes. Your guitar. Ah, and then nobody guitar. else listen to you sing anymore. Cassandra, sell your body. Any of it works. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but they were sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Alan, John McClane came Welcome back to Chats and Movies, the podcast where we answer the question, were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, and this is the podcast for you, I am one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me are my co-hosts, Ash Cookie Wookie Wookie McCann. Hi, y'all. And Big D Dick Ebert. Good evening. Each week, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you'd like to see all the movies we have covered, will cover, or want to choose one for yourself, please visit shatthemovies.com and have a look. By the way, if you're waiting for Lady Hawk, that's going to be April of 2022. I just checked yesterday. At the end of each podcast, we'll provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie takes take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. That's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally, subscribe to our sister podcast, Shat on TV. We review TV series such as Lovecraft Country, Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, True Detective, and Watchmen. Find all the information and past episodes at shoutontv.com. And finally, if you'd like to hang out with us live all week long, please follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel, shoutthemovies.com slash Twitch, where we play video games and host watch parties. And coming up August 27th at 10 p.m. Eastern, it will be Shat Your Life, an evening with the King B. No holds barred interview with the most interesting person we know. All that being said, Big D, what movie are you reviewing today? Gene, this week we're going back to one of my favorite summers of all time. Howard Jones was on the charts with No One Is To Blame, Whitney Houston tearing it up with her first album. My sister graduated high school, had a big party in the backyard. I got to hang out with the older kids. And also this movie came out. One of our devoted listeners, Scott H., wanted to go back to that summer of 1986 and commission one of my favorite romantic comedies one crazy summer when he wrote in and said dear shat crew thanks so much for accepting my special summertime commission for one crazy summer this movie is very special to me and my wife of 29 years we started dating in the summer of 1987 she worked at a mom and pop video rental store and she would always bring home videos for us to watch on date night one of those movies was one crazy summer We love this movie so much because it reminds us of our youth. We were young and didn't have a care in the world. It's just a fun and silly movie. We are watching it now as I'm writing this, and we still laugh and enjoy the silliness. I hope y'all enjoy the movie and it makes you smile. I can't wait to hear your review of it. Y'all keep up the great work on the podcast and have a crazy summer. See you at the Do Drop In, maybe. Scott H. in Friendswood, Texas. I know where that is. Scott, I'm imagining this romance, this dating in the summer of 1987. I can't help but be a little bit jealous here. Like, you got a girlfriend who brings home videos from the movie store, and you just watch them on date nights. I, I, I'm trying to remember back to a time, like, pre-internet, pre-smartphone, when, like, you would just be out with a person, and you're just out with that person. That sounds fucking cool. Mm-hmm. It does. Well, One Crazy Summer is a 1986 romantic comedy written and directed by Savage Steve Holland, starring John Cusack, Demi Moore, Bobcat Goldthwait, Curtis Armstrong, and Joel Murray. Nina Darton of the New York Times wrote, In spite of the director's flair for zany humor, this film is just absurd. Pat Graham of the Chicago Reader found it, quote, Not a bad film, and certainly more polished than Holland's Better Off Dead debut, although it is marred by unevenness and the director's ineradicable penchant for infantile clowning. (laughs) Big D, Ash, we always ask what your memories are of the movie we're covering. We'll start with you, Big D. What are your memories of One Crazy Summer? So, Gene, I can honestly not remember the first time I watched this. Just like Better Off Dead, this has always been a part of growing up. I always remember the lines. It's like The Breakfast Club. It's one of those that's ingrained 
in me. It is near and dear to my heart. It is innocent fun. It is like our commissioner, Scott H. said. It is silly. And a lot of times when we review a movie, I have a problem with that. With this movie, I do not. This is just a simple, fun movie that makes me feel carefree, like I'm the third member of your relationship in 1987, coming home with the video, carefree times all around. Yeah, I mean, I'm a huge John Cusack fan. I always have been. And so I'm not really sure how I've never seen this because I do really love him, especially as a romantic lead. He's one of my favorite romantic lead type guys like Gross Point Blank is, you know, if you don't remember, go listen to the episode because he's just wonderful and that I love say anything. I'm just a big Cusack fan. And so finding something that I hadn't seen him in and getting the opportunity to watch it for the first time. I was pretty excited about that. Yeah, I was embarrassed, Scott. I'll be honest. I was so mad at myself for not realizing that Savage Steve and John Cusack teamed up again after Better Off Dead. I had no idea this movie existed. I mean, I had heard the title One Crazy Summer, but I just thought it was among the blur of 80s high school movies that were made and just nothing of note. I love Better Off Dead, and I was really excited to see this. After seeing that 59% score on Rotten Tomatoes, I was really nervous to watch this for the first time, uh, but pleasantly surprised. All right, Big D, let's relive your childhood and hit that trailer. Ah! Ah! The movie started! The movie started! Not really. I just want them to come running in from the lobby thinking that they missed something. Ha! I'm Ed Stork, movie star. Also known as Bobcat Goldthwait, and me and my friends John Cusack and Demi Moore. I hate boats. I'm not getting on any boat. I beg to differ. Just had one crazy summer. Your dad said you were collecting shells. Shells? 57 millimeter. We did all the normal things people do. Hey, little boy, will you hold on to this for me? Nay, friends. Sorry. Oh, no. Saw the sights. Please, your enormous is anything but chilly. Killed our own food. Women. Ah! Are you ready for me, Hoops? We were party animals. Help me! Everyone loved us. My car. And we loved every minute. God. By the end of the summer, I felt I've grown a lot personally. Mm. I felt a little bit better about who I was and where I was going. Okay, let's move it out. Here we go. Ah, wave. Ah. Crazy Hoops McCann fails to get a basketball scholarship, disappointing his parents. To be admitted into the Rhode Island School of Design, he must write and illustrate a love story for his application. He joins his friends, George and Squid Calamari, to spend the summer on the island of Nantucket, Massachusetts. En route, they pick up a young rock singer named Cassandra Eldridge, who is pursued by a motorcycle gang. Once on the island, Hoops and George, along with twin brothers Egg and Clay Stork and outcast Ak Ak Raymond, must help Cassandra save her grandfather's house from the greedy Beckerstead family. So the movie opens up with a cartoon, and I get that Savage Steve is an animator. He's the guy who like invented the whammy on Press Your Luck, and he does that style of animation. But this gag of his that he likes to do, it's self-indulgent. It hurts his movies. I would literally pay a dollar extra to watch a version of One Crazy Summer that replaced those animations with like just still drawings and trim the narration and just got more to the live action part. But I think the way he uses it in Better Off Dead is more effective. There, it's a daydream. I think it was that everybody wants some. It's when he's flipping burgers and you kind of, you're seeing what's in his head. Here, it's obviously forced and it's a bit darker So the main character this time is like a rhinoceros. I'm like, all right, it's a rhinoceros. He's kind of like that goofy outcast who is walking around with a suitcase that says Beirut. And he talks about carrying an Israeli submachine gun and then tries to shoot the rabbit saying, I'm going to saw these cute, fuzzy bunny bastards in half. Hot lead, hot lead. It's beautiful. I'm like, okay, where are we going with this? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. I got really nervous when it opened up. I was like, great. It's going to be that kind of movie. movie. And 
I was watching this with my mom. And what's really fun is that this is the only part of the movie my mother enjoyed was the animated segment. Whereas as soon as the animated segment was over, I was like, yes, I was very, very happy because immediately they open up on John Cusack in the real world. And look, I get it. We were introduced to Cusack as a nerd in 16 Candles. Like that is the first role that we all kind of got to see him play. But it was a mistake. I think John Hughes made a mistake in that because he's not Anthony. Anthony Michael Hall. I don't know. Like John Cusack for me has always had like this low key swag about him. Mm -hmm. And they capitalize on that here, even in those short shorts and those super preppy tops. Like he still like looks really good in this movie in boat shoes. Y'all, do you know how often I would say that a dude looks good in boat shoes? I don't know if that's ever escaped my mouth before, but he looks great. Yeah, up until a couple of years ago, I refused to wear sandals and I'm still very uncomfortable with them. But when you do like mat work at the gym, you got to, you know, have sandals on. The The Brazilians are very, very serious about their sandals and their mats. I'm starting to reconsider, though, because I started wearing sandals to the beach. Now I'm thinking, fuck, boat shoes was an option. Those look great. Yeah, I, I appreciate the fact that you're expanding your uh, your fashion choices, but I don't know about how I feel about you wearing boat shoes either, Jane, as cool as I think you are. But I do think another good part of this movie is that so the animation part ends, they open up on John Cusack, and then this movie just gets like right down to business, right? Like we get well, our yeah. setting, it sets up the characters, it starts the mm -hmm. plot, there isn't some boring buildup within literally 10 minutes and four seconds, because I paused the movie to look. Within yeah. 10 minutes and four seconds, we have our whole cast together. We've got our conflict decided and we know what it is and the boat to Nantucket is caught. And I have said this a million times and the only time I'm going to veer from this is next week, an interview with the vampire, which I would have been fine with it being a six hour movie. But other than interview with the vampire movie should be 90 minutes. And that's the beauty of a 90 minute movie is you have to like get all the, the shit out of the way and just get started telling your story. And it's not rushed. I mean, to give yourself a comparison, look at how closely One Crazy Summer parallels the opening of Looks Could Kill, right? It's basically like that same formula. You get to see his home life a little bit. There's some trouble at school. There's a graduation scene. And, and this happens in a dozen other 80s high school movies. But this one has so much more charm and energy. There's so much going on. And one thing I, I really noticed now with my second Savage Steve movie is that this guy plants jokes in the background that keep your eyes constantly busy. There's always stuff to look at. And in Better Off Dead, there's like the school dance scene and there's stuff happening in the foreground, but in the background, you got Ricky losing his balloon and he's just jumping up and can't reach it. And it's hilarious. Here we get tons of gags in the background during graduation. Uh, and then like when George shows up on the boat with the chili dogs and you see him in the background with some chili dogs, then you don't see him for a while. And then from off screen during a serious conversation between Hoops and Cassandra, you see just his arm extend out with the chili dog. And all he says is chili dog. It's playful. It's fun. And like you said, Ash, very compact. And I've said this hundreds of times. I hate Chris Farley that he would go back to the well, walking into the door, walking into the door. So I know I've complained about that. But this movie goes back to early gags multiple times. But because it's done in kind of a playful way, I found myself really enjoying it. So we get established early on one of the classic moments the hey, don't don't make that face. If somebody slaps you on the back, your face will stay that way. On the boat, the chili dog shot. Hoops is establishing he can't shoot. He misses, hits a dude in the chest. Guy screams at the girls, hey, you kids. They turn around. Oh, there's ugly kids here. They run around mayhem. Normally, I would hate all this, but they don't dwell on the jokes. They don't hang on them. They're a moment. They're here. They're gone. They're light. And it was really, really enjoyable. You know, but but one of the serious moments of this movie that it hinges on everything. The plot here is to save grandpa's house. Now, we've seen this plenty of times before. We did it in Happy Gilmore, where Happy needed to get two hundred and seventy thousand dollars to pay back taxes. So when we hear the problem that grandpa's house is going to get taken, I'm like, oh, shit, what's it going to take? What are they going to have to do? I did not remember it. And Cassandra's like, yeah, I got to find three thousand dollars. I'm like. Wait, three thousand dollars? The three that we're talking eighty six. I understand three thousand was more, but you couldn't do that with like some neighborhood fundraiser. Grandpa's taking in people of the community. You couldn't just go out there and put up signs to get people the money. She, I know she's not going to do it. If she slept with a couple of the prominent members of the Nantucket community, she could easily get three grand in a night. I don't know. I think that. 
three grand is a lot of cash, not just for 86, but when you're 18 years old, right? Like when I was 18, even when I was like 20, I don't feel I could have raised 3000 this quick unless I were like bartending at Mardi Gras. And then you make a shit ton of cash. But I think you forget that like 3K was it's a lot of fucking money when we were younger. Yeah, I mean, that's like that's like 15 commissions, Big D. Uh-huh. Yeah, but but we don't look like Demi Moore. Okay, Demi Moore gets a million dollars to sleep with somebody later on. She's going to got three grand at this time. <laughs> right. So you're saying that Cassandra should have, you know, put herself out there literally? Yeah. Like, that's fuck. No. Like, $3,000 would have been. I, I I'll tell you, I remember the first time I ever ran up a credit card bill. I was in college and I didn't really understand money. And I ran up like a $1,200 balance on a credit card. And like I've said before on the show, like my family, like I didn't come from money. And so my dad was like, well, fuck, have a good time trying to figure out how to pay that. Right. Because he was not going to pay 1200 bucks for me. Yeah. Fucking thank God. Big D wasn't your dad. I know. Big D was my dad. The donation fairy would have come and taken my car and it would have been hocked, you know, to pay the $1,200 fee, right? Either that or you you would have been shaking hands with the New Orleans elite. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Fucking creep. (laughs) But, you know, I mean, $1,200, it took like a long time to figure out how to get that. And that wasn't even half of this. So give Cassandra some credit. It's fucking hard to raise 3K in 86. Well, Hoops runs afoul of Teddy Beckerstead and his neglected girlfriend, Cookie. She secretly offers Hoops a date, and he is persuaded to go out with her, even though he had promised to appear at Cassandra's first musical performance. Teddy's friend, Ty, sees them and notifies Teddy. Meanwhile, Egg gets stuck in a Godzilla costume and causes havoc at Beckerstead's promotional party for the Beckerstead Estates, which would be located at the spot of Cassandra's grandfather's house. As Teddy's crew threatens Hoops' crew, Cassandra offers a basketball challenge, which Teddy dominates. Cassandra is upset that Hoops did not appear for her performance and lied that he was a good basketball player. So if you've not seen this movie, one of the more charming things about it are the amount of sight gags that they use to a really effective means. And I'm not usually a fan of sight gags. I usually think they're kind of cheesy, especially when they're like your main source of humor, like when you depend on them too much. And here they depend on them a lot, but they work because they're not afraid to get ridiculous. And so visually, it's really funny. The dog with the cone around its neck, we've seen that a thousand times before. But the way that they do it here is funny and unique. When John Cusack is at the drive-in and the trees he uses, like the little bushes, like to put in front of his face and the car, it's hilarious. The shot of that empty ashtray at the empty bar when Demi Moore starts singing, it's funny and they're really, really smart. Yeah. And normally like you, Ash, I'm not laughing at something as like dumb and simple as kids getting stuck in an ugly face or a guy (laughs) accidentally being caught in a Godzilla suit. But not to use a a basketball analogy here, but but there are rebounds on these jokes, right? That first joke doesn't make it. They're going to pick it up and they're going to make another joke attempt, right? Those kids, like you mentioned, Big D, they come back in several jump scare scenes. My favorite one, I mean, you mentioned the one on the boat, but when they slam into the hood of the car and like <laughs> freak everybody out in the car, it's great. The fat guy in the chair, uh, you know, sitting on top of George's head, eating all those snacks. It's not funny in itself. Like fat guy in a chair. That's where a lot of movies would stop. Like, isn't that gross? There was a fat guy sitting in a chair on top of his head and he was stuck in the sand. But in this case... They take it a step further with all this like delicious junk food falling around George's head. And he's just trying to like stick his tongue out and just get a little little taste of it because that's what we would all do. Like, really, we would. Um, The Godzilla suit thing. I mean, you got you got Bobcat Goldthwait and he's stuck in a Godzilla suit. And that's where a lot of movies would stop. But they they build (laughs) on that. It's like, okay, he's in the bushes and he's trying to eat cookies, but he can't get him into his mouth. And then the cigar goes into his mouth or smoke coming out of him. He comes screaming and roaring out of the bushes. And then there's this model set of the town and he goes crashing into that. I was in tears at this point. 
Yeah, you know, a movie like The Great Outdoors should take a cue from this film for running gags because we, you know, kind of railed on them for the running gag of the raccoons and how it got old and didn't work. But here these running gags do. And y'all, the Godzilla thing, when he looks in the mirror and he says, it's really good to be back here at Club Tokyo. Like, (laughs) it's so ridiculous, but so funny. And I don't know if y'all are big Arrested Development fans, but there is this hilarious scene in Arrested Development where Tobias comes out and he's dressed as a big mole because he thinks that like the mole not like the mole that's like you know infiltrating something but like a physical mole and he stomps through this town with these Japanese investors and I feel like it had to have been influenced and inspired by this scene because it borders on the edge of like should I be laughing at this but it's fucking hilarious it it, I mean sure it was really funny in 86 and even today in 2021 like it holds up really well and and Gene, they double down. When you think it's done, they throw it again. So he storms through the whole model, ruins it, right? Then you notice that the head banker from Nantucket is Asian. So we're thinking he's Japanese. He's going to be offended and leave. No, he loves it. He turns to the to the head guy and goes, "Ha! Huh, this is great. This is very funny." He gets choked out. And you talk about the beach scene with the fat guy, right? The best part of it is it's a running gag, but each time. It's not the fact that he's passed out. You see the ambulance coming, and it's the paramedics debating who's going to give mouth to mouth. I'm your superior. You do it. Them fighting over CPR each time. So good. And Scott, I want to thank you for renewing my faith in Bobcat Goldthwait. I was a big fan of Bobcat when I was a kid, like Police Academy and stuff. And I was super disappointed when I discovered that Bobcat wasn't some underdog actor with Tourette's but rather a guy with a sort of weird voice who played up nervous tics for laughs. It, it's an act. It's an act that he developed doing stand-up. But aside from that, he's just really funny. Like in the scenes where the ladies come up and they ask him to help them put their boat in the water. And he's like, that sounds like work. Like, mm-hmm. no. And then while they're carrying the boat, he just continues on. What do you, you want us to shovel your driveway? You got anything heavier we could carry like a car? And it's all happening. Like Big D says, they don't stop for the joke. The action's still happening, but the jokes are just dropping as they go. And Ash, as you mentioned with the Godzilla suit, when he's left alone in that prop truck, we can't even see what he's looking at, but his reactions to things we can't see had me falling off the couch. And I literally yell after when he was trying to connect in the mechanic shop and he starts off his personal story with, let me tell you a story about a little fat boy that nobody loved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but also, I, Ash, I want to go back to what you said about hot young John Cusack in his boat shoes and his short shorts. Mm-hmm. He He's a good looking guy. He's yes, not he the is. typical nerd. But this movie hinges on the fact that Hoops is looking for love. Poor Cupid keeps going to the wrong door. It won't find him. How is he going to do a cartoon about love? He doesn't know anything about it. Boo hoo hoo. I'm sorry. He's had probably the two hottest women on that island who are after him. He gets Cookie into the car in the in the drive through. He's kissing her and he chooses to bail out because he's afraid of the boyfriend. He is not having any problem. He's very capable and very successful at finding love. I don't know. Again, I think there's a big difference here with this age group right like there's a difference between girls and love like there's a difference between like a hookup and love and i think he's a dude who's like that sensitive guy like gene talks about himself like you know trying to find the right you know great expectations you know passage to you know be able to quote to his well let's go even deeper and then let's go weathering heights really if we're gonna like be true to our like gothness right trying to find the perfect passage where Heathcliff kind of like negs but loves and feels the darkness of Catherine you know he's got to find that in order to hook up with a girl successfully and that's what you know he's doing here he could he could hook up but he don't want to hook up he wants to wants to feel something big D do you fucking think that hoops is sitting around reading weathering heights does he seem like that kind of guy John Cusack is. Liz Ash, I I, uh, I hate to disappoint you here, but uh, at 18, I'm not complaining. No, <laughs> like, like love <laughs> girls. I don't give a shit. It's 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 a it's a no. female body that's interested in yep. me and it's attractive. Sold. Yeah. Yeah. You know. hook up and then you fall in love. That's yeah. exactly what Cusack would have done. Well, especially with Demi Moore, right? Like Demi Moore is beautiful in this. Like she is so incredibly beautiful like i don't know how you resist that for sure but 
I think there's a difference here. He wants some love. That's what his cartoons <laughs> say, at least. No. I mean, the outfits help her sister, for sure. <laughs> she looks like a canvas sack with legs. He really did. Hoops and his friends promote Cassandra's next performance, which turns out to be a big success. But Aguila Beckerstead immediately forecloses on Cassandra's grandfather's house before it can be saved. Ak Ak proposes they take part in a local regatta, despite Hoops' fear of the water. Teddy's team recklessly injures a member of the Australian team, and Ak Ak jumps in the water to save him. Aguila then sabotages Hoops' sail with a crossbow. To repair the mast, Hoops successfully shoots the new guy line into the mast, and they continue onward. Aguila is thrown overboard by Squid, operating a mechanical dolphin from a nearby movie set. Hoops and his team win the boat race after using Teddy's car engine as their motor. So if you've seen Better Off Dead and you've seen One Crazy Summer, you feel like it was filmed continuously, almost like the Lord of the Rings when they filmed the three movies in a row when they got everybody in New Zealand. Because as you're watching it, I'm like, whoa. That, that guy at the gas station, you know, that's Taylor Negron. That's the mailman. That's the little boy smut. He's the delivery guy or the crossing guard. Wait, wait, that's Laura Waterburn. That's little Ricky's mom. Or you get Curtis Armstrong, who's Akak instead of Charles Del Mar. Instead of them fixing up that Camaro, we get a building montage where they're fixing the boat for the regatta. These two definitely seem like there's some correlation. I also love that Taylor Negron's uh, name on his work shirt is Taylor. It got my memory going. I was like, where have I seen that guy before? Oh, wait, it's Taylor Negron from Better Off Dead and The Last Boy Scout. But Big D, you missed a key cast character that they added on for One Crazy Summer, which is Jeremy Piven, Mm -hmm. who looks as old as he does now. It's freaky. You know, it's so funny because I kept going, is that fucking Jeremy Piven? But he looks so old for 86. I was yeah. like, this is like the poor man's Jeremy Piven. This is the slightly chunky baby fat version of Jeremy Piven, but it's not actually Jeremy Piven. And then I watched the credits. I was like, holy shit. He's like Maggie Smith, right? We talked in Hook about how she's always been old. Jeremy Piven has always looked like an asshole and kind of like a 40-year-old man. And the other guy they added on to the movie is Mark Metcalf, who was, uh, you might recognize as Niedermeyer from Animal House. And he's got to be the weirdest villain in Shat history. Agula Beckerstead is established early on as just fucking sadistic. And mm-hmm. I love the lengths they went through. Ash, like you said, that zany, that off the wallness, where they're like, how do we show this guy is evil? I know he's going to put a live lobster into a pot of boiling water and then use a stethoscope to hear it scream he's gonna shoot lobsters on a spinning wheel with a crossbow and then there's this scene where they kind of like put the the flyer on his door and you know ding dong ditch and he comes out and he's just zipping up his pants you don't know what the fuck he's doing and jerking (laughs) off or or something worse and then he goes back inside the house then he just pokes his head out again and he's just eerily peering out into the neighborhood and then he he kicks bosco the dog like this has got to be the worst guy we've ever seen yeah he made a career out of that Anyone who grew up in that time would recognize him from all of the Twisted Sisters videos. He was like the dad who was like, what are you going to do with your life? I want to rock. There you go. He made a career out of that. Well, D. Schneider has one thing over Demi Moore, which is that he's got some sort of like charisma, at least when on stage. Because guys, I love Demi Moore, but I do not buy her as the cool girl rock star. She earnestly closes her eyes while singing. And that has always been something that really bothers me. There's that great scene in the movie about a boy where he talks about how people that close their eyes to sing that he just has to run out of the room because he can't stand it. And when she's in front of that empty bar, which is a very funny scene, they then cut back to her and she closes her eyes and she does this weird like duck lip pouty pout thing. And I don't know, would y'all think that she fit the role? Because I think she's pretty miscast. And I know we didn't have auto-tune back then because hashtag T-Pain didn't exist yet, but it sounded auto-tuned and I just felt really badly for her. Well, Ash, as the former vocalist and founding member of Dom <laughs> and the Infernos, I can tell you that if you're a shitty singer uh, that plays very small clubs that no one attends, you have two friends. Uh, one of them is reverb from the sound man, and the other one is a chorus pedal. So you can have live vocal effects as you uh, as you sing, but nothing in the range of what the fuck Cassandra was doing. 
I never had the benefit of having like an entire choir of black maids to help me. Uh, <laughs> but I'd like to think that we were better than than this band. What I don't understand is why they didn't just get E.G. Daly from Better Off Dead, who rocks, is yes. very believable as a singer, is very cute and has a ton of charisma. She would have been a fucking home run in this movie. Well, Hoops and his friends celebrate their victory. They're awarded the prize. Squid's injured dog turns out okay after giving birth to puppies. George hooks up with Cookie, and Akak wins his stern father's approval for his heroics. Hoops offers the trophy to Teddy if he spares Cassandra's grandfather's house, but Teddy immediately backs out on his promise. However, old man Beckerstead, the father of Aguila and the grandfather of Teddy, gives back the trophy and spares Cassandra's house, stating he wasn't going to put a dime in the Beckerstead estates. He then drags Teddy away by his ear. So the plot of this movie, and I'm using that term plot loosely, okay? It is a series of <laughs> scenes that get from point A to point B. There is no logic to any of it. The race converting that skeleton of a boat into something that could to win the regatta, using a stolen engine from a Ferrari and putting in a boat, people wanting to hear Cassandra's terrible singing, the little sister somehow piloting the dolphin from foam to the bank selling the deed to the house early, Akak collecting the actual artillery shells that somehow are at the impact area instead of where the actual artillery shot them out. And forget about the fact this is on a beach. It's a populated area of Nantucket. None of it makes logical sense, but I'm completely fine with it. It doesn't need to. It is It is light. It is fun. And for a change, Ashley, I don't need a bracket. I don't need an explanation. Mm. I don't need background. I am completely fine with this not making any sense. I still argue that Mortal Kombat made sense without the brackets. But I do agree with you. This, this is ridiculous. Like, this movie is... Absolutely ridiculous. And Jean and I caught a lot of flack after Harley Davidson, the Marlboro Man, where people were like, what the fuck? Like, we went and watched this movie and it sucked. It made no sense. Well, I can tell you that movie was brilliant because it was just ridiculous. And this one is also brilliant because of its ridiculousness, except for one scene, which is the scene where these lobsters attack our two characters in the pool. And so... Our one actor does a great job of, you know, holding the fake plastic lobster and making it look like it's biting his nose. But the beautiful girl in the pool gets out and you can just see where someone has like pinned with a safety pin this lobster onto her bathing suit because it's little you know, claws, it's little graspers are just plastic and hanging there. And you can see where it like pulls away from the bathing suit and how it's <laughs> adhered. Other than the awful lobster scene, the ridiculousness of this film just makes sense. Big D, I just had a thought. You're trying to raise $3,000. You got a truck full of lobster. Fucking lobster. Sell mm. the fucking lobster. Sell lobster the truck. rolls. Sell the truck. You Sell the Ferrari. <laughs> Sell the rocket launcher. <laughs> yes. Your guitar. Hey, and then nobody guitar. has to listen to you sing anymore. Cassandra, sell your body. Any of it works. Oh, my God. <laughs> You're really into Demi Moore selling her body. I think you've watched uh, Decent 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 too many times. Yeah. <laughs> you do what you got to do. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Also, Ash, uh, maybe these lobsters were fucked up because they were dumped into a pool, which would you know kill a lobster. But I think that scene yeah. was much more about Teddy's reaction than crustacean accuracy. Like Teddy's great, and he we haven't given enough credit yet in this pod. This is such an over the top performance. He's so stiff. He's such an asshole that when he gets in the water, you're just waiting. You're waiting. You're waiting for the. And they don't give it to you just yet. They make you wait just a little while until he's being an asshole to Cookie, and then the lobsters attack. That suspense is great. Well, Gene, as a native Floridian, uh, I would tell you that saltwater pools are fairly as common as chlorine. Mm. So it is a possibility. It is an upscale area. He might have had it, but I just love, I got to do my laps, dad. <laughs> I got to do my laps. <laughs> the floaties. <laughs> Well, another thing that's absolutely ridiculous in this movie, but again, works, is this shark reveal that we get at the end of the regatta. And so we've been together long enough, a year and a half now, the three of us, that we've explored 
all of these Mm. ridiculous moments that just don't make sense. There's things that are funny and we don't understand why they're funny. There's things that are good, but we don't understand why they're good. And this shark reveal is one of those things. It is a dumb fucking gag. The dude's legs are sticking out. It's this foam shark. It looks so (laughs) stupid. And then the little girl comes out of the top with her little goggles and her wetsuit. And I smiled and like, y'all, I almost applauded. Like I got so into this moment. It's so earnest. You cannot help but be invested and be happy. It makes no sense. Uh, Ash, I hate to do this to you here, okay? but a few podcasts ago, you said you were, quote, hyper intelligent. I'm going to have to pull that card today. That's a dolphin. That's not a shark. That's foam the dolphin. Okay. When I said I was hyper intelligent, it wasn't because I was a zoologist or someone that specializes <laughs> in animals. It's, it's just a, literature. It's, it's a dolphin with rabies. Yeah, and, and that's the that's thing true. is that is and that's the thing is they take the time to set it up throughout the movie. They talk yeah. repeatedly about how ridiculous a dolphin with rabies is, and it's on a movie set, and they're like, No one will believe that thing is real. It looks terrible. So when it does look terrible, you're like, All right. And and Ash, I agree with you. Squid is a fucking G. I'd not expect her to come popping out of that dorsal fin. It was awesome. And I thought it was even sweeter when I found out that that character is based on Savage Steve's little sister, also nicknamed Squid. But I'm right there with you. If I was in the theater and this scene happened, I'm standing up and applauding. I don't care what people think. 100%. With the prize returned and the house spared, Hoops and Cassandra kiss, and she inspires a love story for Hoops' college application. In the final scene, George's Uncle Frank finally wins the $1 million prize from a radio contest, but his phone gets disconnected and his prize is given away to someone else. He snaps and promptly uses a rocket launcher to blow up the radio station. Shortly thereafter, the Stork Twins arrive and head to the still-burning station to roast marshmallows. So we focused on Cassandra a lot more than I expected to tonight. And admittedly, I've been listening to Boys for Pele on repeat this week in preparation for our interview with the Vampire podcast. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't help thinking that Cassandra is based on Tori Amos or maybe the other way around. And I know half the listenership is like, who the fuck is Tori Amos? Go Google her. Uh, Listen, they both are singer songwriters with like a sort of hippie fairy energy and ridiculous outfits. They both have crazy hair that's sometimes braided, sometimes doing wild shit. Cassandra plays her show at where the do drop in, which was the title of Tori Amos's tour in support of her album boys for Pele. I think there's a connection. Oh God. I hope not because Tori Amos is a goddess i don't know who out there doesn't know who she is she's amazing and cassandra's awful and i really hope that this wasn't some weird ass tribute to tori amos because tori deserves so much more than demi Moore earnestly closing her eyes while singing slightly off key is big d googling tori amos right now is that what you're doing over there i've seen tori amos i know tori amos have you heard tori amos or just seen her I saw her at the Paramount. I saw her in New York. I saw her. Hey, play. Like saw her live. I saw her live. Oh. I saw her play. She's great. Yeah. No. Okay. This is this is Edie Brickell. That's who this is. This uh, is that. Like, hippie. I know what I know. If you know, yeah, what I, I know mean. what I know. That's exactly who this is. This is Tori Amos. Is a smoke show. She is a sultry with the red hair. She's she's hot. This is the hippie. I know what I know. That's what she and is. You know what I mean? Exactly. That's who that Do is. Yeah. But or you know, and later on, maybe that could have been the uh, Alanis Morissette. It's that that genre, I think, of singer. But this, well, oh my God, it is Edie Brickell. She's it's a tribute to Hoops. Shove me in the shallow waters before I get too deep. Yeah, <gasps> don't let me get too deep. Yeah, we're making connections here. And this movie does something that I think is very rare. A lot of times when we think back and we reminisce on our favorite movies, you remember the main plot point. You remember the main characters. You remember moments like that. In this movie, it's the opposite. It's the characters who really aren't the big players. I always think when I think about this movie is squid with the slap on the back and the girl's face is stuck or frank finally winning the contest and pulling the cord out of the wall and blowing up the radio station with rich little in it jumping out the window it is so rare i think that a movie becomes memorable for almost the collection of its parts and the little things in the background instead of the main things that are we should be focusing on screen yeah 
I think this might be Savage Steve's thing because the same ghosts are better off dead. Like with the two dollars paper boy, that's what people remember. Not the main characters or Ricky's super awkward, possessive behavior. You know, sorry, I blew up your mom. Like that, those are the moments that you remember. Not so much anything that's like keyed in on the actual plot. The plot's almost irrelevant, right? It's just there to kind of to kind of give the movie some sort of direction. And I'm so glad that the band got back together for another movie after Better Off Dead because like John Cusack was soured on Better Off Dead after you know the critics tore it apart. And fun fact, the two bunnies that get blown up by the bomb at the end of the movie, the end animation, are actually stand-ins for Siskel and Ebert. So looks like there was a little bit of defiance there. looks like they believed in themselves just one last time. And uh, again, Scott, you gave us a gift here because I never even knew this movie existed. Well, now is the time for our wipe scores. The wipe scores are our way of telling you how many wipes this movie takes to get off your butt. Zero Wipes is a perfect movie. It is a mechanical dolphin with rabies. Mm -hmm. And Five Wipes is an absolute disaster movie. It is whatever the fuck was going on in that room with Uncle Frank. Uh, Let's start with you, Big D. What's your score for One Crazy Summer? Okay, I'm going to start giving my review here like it's a normal movie we would do. I'd be like, uh, the romantic aspect of the story is a bit weak, you know, but as a comedy, there was a few chuckles to be found here and there. Unfortunately, the overall story was neither original. You know, it wasn't really significant. The cast was enjoyable. You know, I thought the Cusack and Demi Moore were likable. Uh, it was good to see Jeremy Pivens when he was young was the same douchebag he is today. You know, Bobcat and Curtis Anderson were memorable, but none of that matters. This is a movie that's an hour and 30 minutes. It is simple, good-hearted, fun. It's light. Some is forgettable, but it is a perfect recipe. This is what a summer in 86 felt like. You went out to the movies. You spent two bucks on a box of, of now and laters or raisinets. You sat there and you came out and life was good. This movie is simple, enjoyable, and, and I got to give it 1.75 wipes. All right, this 1.75 wipes from Big D. Big D, I thought you'd be joining me on the one wipe podium because I think this movie was an absolute gift. It could have easily been Better Off Dead too, as you mentioned, because it's every bit as good as Better Off Dead. Savage Steve does have a habit of throwing every joke at the wall and seeing what sticks, but it works. The cast is charming as hell. And even the lesser knowns, like Joel Murray from uh, Mad Men, and as you mentioned, Big D, Taylor Negron from Fast Times and The Last Boy Scout, they're doing work here. I think that he really brought out the best in everybody in the cast. And for me, it's a one wiper. Yeah, I mean, this movie is why I love doing this podcast. As much fun as it is to go back and revisit movies that are important, like from my own life, what's even more fun is getting to see the movies that I missed, that I didn't know about. And this is one of them. I absolutely love this movie. I thought that it was lighthearted. It didn't take itself too seriously. And it was just fun. And movies today are so serious. They don't often and just, yes. you know, be fun for fun's sake. They're not as ridiculous as this because they're too worried about these formulas that have proven themselves to be successful. I don't think a movie like this could be made in 2021. And that's a real bummer because a crazy ass little journey like this, that's just like vignette after vignette, it almost felt like mad TV and what mad TV mm-hmm. was in its first few seasons. It, it made no sense that it worked, but it did. And I am going to be like right in between you guys. And I'm going to go with 1.5 wipes all right that's one and a half wipes from ash one wipe from me and one and three quarter wipes from big d who apparently thought red dawn was better than this that gives us an average wipe (laughs) score of 1.583 repeating wipes for one crazy summer listen i'm I'm gonna die on that wall for red dawn it makes no sense it was like i was in that concentration camp with like a year uh i can't i can't explain it and i don't feel guilty for it Speaking of dying on that wall, I can't wait until we do A Few Good Men and you have to compare that to Red Dawn. Oh, and you're going to have no wiggle room at all. It's going to be I, fun gonna watching call, you squirm. I'm going to call in sick that week. I'm going to get an audible. and get you do a Code Red? Red? Yes, yeah, Code Red. I'm going to get Code Red myself that week. Uh, so, Gene, with a score of 1.58, that now ties this in the 77 spot with Clue and Leon the Professional. Slightly better than Gremlins, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, and slightly worse than Scarface and Magnolia. Poor Clue. Poor Clue. Yeah. I hated Clue. And yeah, you did, now, you, did, I, I, you did Clue dirty, man. 3.25 is not dirty. I That's thought dirty. I would have given it much. Clue is a great fucking movie, man. No, it's not. Eh, maybe. 
I was in that angry. You know what Roger it's better piece. than? Red fucking dawn. <laughs> mm. I think we had a voicemail about that. <laughs> yes, we did. Gene, we actually did. <laughs> this week we got a couple of voicemails. We're gonna play some of them now. And one of them has to do with Red Dawn. So we're gonna play from one of our listeners, Jeff, who's on the better side of the falls in Niagara, what he thought about Red Dawn. What's up, Shat the Movies crew? This is Niagara Jeff, the better side of the falls. Niagara Jeff, I'm just looking across, seeing the beautiful falls and Niagara Falls, New York. I'm still not allowed in, but I can't wait to get back for some chicken wings. Listen up, y'all. Red Dawn, fantastic movie. Big D, you're 100% correct, okay? You guys have to understand, if you were a Gen Xer growing up in the 80s, you were afraid, of the commies coming over and destroying you. Big D, you're exactly right. When I was a kid, we had army fatigues. We had fake M16 guns, and we were running all... We were Canadians doing this. (laughs) G.I. Joe was a thing. It was ridiculous. We were afraid of all these commies, so Red Dawn came out, and it was was our anthem. And And it also helped that you had the C. Thomas Howell, Charlie Sheen, Patrick Swayze. You had all these kind of ensemble characters. It was amazing, this film. I I don't understand how you guys could have given it a four. It's definitely definitely a one. It's not a masterpiece, but it's a little bit of a (laughs) – I just just kissed my lips in blue. It's a little bit of a gem (laughs) from the 80s, and if you're not not a – you know, if you're not a Gen Xer, you don't you don't get it. It just looks so stupid. Yeah. So reviewing it, I'm going to give this a one with a big D. You're 100 percent correct. Anyway, guys, yes. you're doing a fantastic job. Keep it up. I will see you soon. As soon as the border is open. Ciao. Thank you very much. I think that's as angry as a Canadian gets. Okay, so I, I just got to thank you first of all, Jeff, for just a, a beautiful voice. I mean, that was theater in and of itself. I could see it in my mind every every moment of it. The falls, your chef's kiss, but with regard to being a Gen Xer and, and, and Red Dawn, listen, I had the GI Joe tent. I had the GI Joe walkie talkies. I had the fake M16. I dressed in fatigues all the time. Uh, even had, I even had camo boxers. That's how into it. I was, I would go into my tent and I would watch out with binoculars looking for the commies to be coming across the apartment complex. So I felt all of that. I watched that episode of Benson where it's like a meteor or something, but I thought it was a nuclear Holocaust. That's how into it. I was, um, Still doesn't change the fact that that Red Dawn took itself way too seriously. You could take that cast, but like make it f- like teen palatable, right? Like it was just it was it was laughable how hard they tried to convey the drama and how horribly they failed. It hurts me that you can laugh at the trauma I, I faced <laughs> as a kid. Oh my god! The Canadians feared it. The Russians came down. They were victims. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for sharing my memories. Uh, next, Gene, we have a voicemail comes from one of our listeners who is also a fellow podcaster, Mallory. Hi, Shat the Movies team. Uh, my name is Mallory. I'm a fellow movie podcaster. I co-host a podcast called Movie Lovers. Aside from that, though, I've been obsessed with your guys' podcast for many moons now, and uh, I just listened to your episode on Hook. Uh, well, you guys kind of crapped on my heart just a little bit with that movie. I do realize I definitely look at Hook with some rose-colored glasses. Uh, my co-host and my life partner, Jonah, his favorite movie, uh, from his childhood is Goonies. I feel like Hook is my Goonies. So, anyway, great episode. I really love listening to it. You guys have so many awesome episodes, but in particular, I've really loved the ones, obviously, on some of my favorite movies like Empire Records, Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead, really loved your take on how shitty their mom is, uh, Wayne's World, Tommy Boy, and my favorite movie of all time, E.T. Um, yeah, I just, I love the show and I had to call in, even though sometimes I want to slap Big D across the face for crapping on my favorite movies, <laughs> but I guess that's what your show is Thank all you. about. Um, I about shit my pants when you guys said you were going to be doing Interview with a Vampire. I can't wait for that episode, so I'm going to keep my eyes peeled for that. I'll probably plug it on our Movie Lovers social media because I do that whenever I find a good episode from a podcast that I love. 
And yeah, I just had to call in, especially since you guys said you were looking for uh, ladies to call in. I agree. Uh, being called a she shatter sucks, but uh, lady of chat, I, I can get on board with. So thanks, guys. I uh, mm-hmm. love the podcast and keep doing what you do. You're awesome. See, a lady of chat, it's so much better. It's just. It's so much better. And I just, I appreciate this. And, and let me say, I don't know, y'all, I'm I'm getting nervous about Interview with the Vampire. Fuck yes, I, I am too. I feel like, well, you shouldn't because like you're not, this isn't like inherent to like your person. Like, I feel like this is our Super Bowl gene and everybody knows it and it's <laughs> coming up and I don't know. I feel like maybe we need to like set the scene. We need to have like candles when we record. Maybe we need to pick like specific clothing to wear because if we fuck this up, this could be the end, guys. <laughs> this Some could be it. Yeah. yeah, this is a eulogy for your grandparents. This is writing your wedding vows. Yes. Like you cannot, you get one shot at it. I think I'm more nervous about this than writing my wedding vows because I knew he was in it anyway, right? Like he wasn't fucking going to turn around and walk out. Like this, people could turn us off. Brad Pickett or worse, Anne Rice could mm. listen to this podcast and go, well, they fucking got that wrong. You'll never be allowed to go home again. Ever. Yeah, I'm nervous as well. You know, th- there's certain movies that you're like, okay, this is going to be a popular one. A lot of people love this. I never would have guessed Interview with the Vampire would be that. But what? as soon as... Oh, come on. It's... You know, I, before you two, I've never met anyone who was like passionate or was like a an adult would dress up as a vampire. So you I, guys okay, are the first. First of all, can we just talk about the disdain on Big D says before what? you two, <laughs> like like you know, that we represent those young whippersnappers who care about the children of the night. It just occurred to me this is a goth podcast. Now the odd man yes, out. I'm the, he I'm is. the daywalker over there. That's why I'm nervous. <laughs> Because I don't, I don't know what I feel like. Blade walking into the underground blood rave. I don't know what I'm in for. Oh, it's so much worse than that. You're like yeah. our familiar. <laughs> oh no! Like we do our dark work, and then you publish mm-hmm. it. Oh no! I'm, mm-hmm. I don't, I'm scared to even see what this means. But yeah, I'm <laughs> nervous about this because the people have been coming out of the woodwork with excitement for this. Can I just tell you how much I love that this podcast began? With us talking about one crazy summer, it has ended with you calling Big D our familiar, which like <laughs> only about 5% of our listening audience probably understands that reference. Isn't that like the slave, the vampire slave? Yeah, like Redfield. Yes. You're our Redfield. Yes. You're going to be You're eating bugs pretty soon. <laughs> and when he crossed the bridge, the phantoms came to meet him. Oh, Jesus. Protect me. Everyone out there. Jeff, gather the forces north of the border. I need some help. Get down here. Uh, For our last voicemail this week, we're going to go back to one of our uh, prolific supporters, Steve, who commissioned Hook, which was terrible. And Steve, I guess, has some kind of problem with that. So hold on. Let's hear what Steve's got to say. Hey, guys. uh, Hot Sauce Steve here. So I have one complaint about my Hook email. We we disagreed about the scores, and uh, Dustin Hoffman's performance as Hook totally should have uh, given that a better score, but that's not my complaint. My complaint is I brought up in my email about, you know, putting things before your kids uh, and, like, realize this movie made you realize, you know what? Uh, I, I shouldn't put those things before my kids. You guys didn't even bring that up in the entire, like, podcast at all my big complaint so uh maybe address that or something anyways excited for my next batch of uh commissions starting with aliens and uh big d i do have robin hood men in tights ashley that goes out to you just for you but i love that movie and uh because it's a mel brooks movie maybe you could also revisit baseball i don't know and uh rescore that one for us because i know you uh Gave it such a full white score because of uh, Roger. So let's record <laughs> that along with Robin Hood Men and Tights, and that'd be awesome. That'd make up for not addressing the big thing I brought up in the email for the commission. That'd be great. Thanks. Bye. Okay, so Steve, I remember on the podcast, I discussed Arnold Schwarzenegger in Jingle All the Way, and I said he was a dad who worked hard. He put his job above his family. Hook! He's an asshole who hates his kids. There was no lesson about spending more time with your kids. He hates them. He tells them to basically shut the fuck up that he, he 
totally, totally different story. Yes, you should spend time with your kids, but this movie was not the thing to teach people that lesson. And also, that isn't the point of the movie, right? Like the whole point of the movie is that he hates being like a domesticated dude. Like that's who Peter yes. Pan is. It's the irony of the guy who never wants to grow up having children. And that would have been an interesting movie that would have had the wipe score that you're talking about. But this movie didn't do that, right? Like, and Dustin Hoffman's performance, that's why we didn't give it five wipes. So <laughs> you know. true. I feel like yes. check, check, check. Yeah. Spend time with your kids, folks, out there. If this movie is what's going to teach you that, we got issues. He hated his kids. And maybe don't spend time with them watching Hook because it's a really fucking terrible movie. Yes. he. It was a loss not of his innocence, a loss of his ability to go out there and hook up. He was a pervert. He wanted some sexual freedom. Hook up? Oh. oh. Wow. Hook oh, up. Wow. Well, next week, the main event. Ding, 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 ding. We need, we need some music, but not like the <laughs> da, 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 like some sort of gothy, like as as like excited as we get. Well, I was thinking something like the NFL, like the, like, the cold wind. You mean like how I went, da, 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 like I'm no, starting to a, sing that. I don't know. Can you think of anything that would be good? Uh, apotheosis. Hmm. What the dun 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 What did you say? From Excalibur. Oh no. Dun 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 dun. How about like O Fortuna? I bet you that's it. Sounds like it. Whatever it is. Well, next week, folks, ding, ding, ding. It is the main event. Mm-hmm. Born as an 18th century lord. Actually, you know what, Ash? Why don't you take the honor this week? Absolutely. Born as an 18th century lord, Louis is now a bicentennial vampire, telling a story to an eager biographer. Suicidal after the death of his family, he meets Lestat, a vampire who persuades him to choose immortality over death and become his companion. Eventually, gentle Louis resolves to leave his violent maker, but Lestat guilts him into staying by turning a young girl whose addition to the family breeds even more conflict. And this is commissioned by Adam and Josh R. It was released November 11th, 1994, directed by Neil Jordan, and the first of what it will hopefully eventually be a redone series based off of The Vampire Chronicles. I think I'm going to be upset when I find out what a familiar does. I think I'm going to be very upset. (laughs) Well, that's the thing. Familiars never find out what familiars do. So, Well, I'm going to when I watch this movie. Well, familiars aren't in this. That's a different iteration. Oh, of okay. well, I got I to gotta Google that then. Well, that concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shat the Movies. You can email us, host at shatthemovies.com. Support the podcast by shopping our Amazon affiliate link, completing a free anonymous survey to help attract advertisers, buying our merch, or commissioning your own movie. Find all information by visiting our website, shatthemovies.com. Also, check out our sister podcast, Shat on TV. We review TV series such as Lovecraft Country, Westworld, True Detective, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, and Watchmen. Find all the information on our website, ShatOnTV.com. Wherever we're fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe, and if you stop by iTunes, please leave a five-star review. That helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co-hosts, Big D and Ash, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us next week for the most amazing movie of all time. Mm-hmm. I want to say we get started. So you want me to tell you the story of my life? I'll tell you my story. I'll tell you all of it. I'm flesh and blood, but not human. I haven't been human for 200 years. From the novel by Anne Rice. From Neil Jordan, the director of The Crying Game. I've come to answer your prayers. Life has no meaning anymore, does it? His name is Lestat. But what if I could give it back to you? Pluck out the pain and give you another life. One you could never imagine. I can see you lying on a bit of satin. He chose one man. He gave him infinite power. Eternal life. 
and a daughter who would be forever young. This is the only real evil left. And then he took the light of day. You're a vampire. You never knew what life was until it ran out in a red gush over your lips. I can't stand this any longer. You made us what we are, didn't you? If God kills indiscriminately, and so shall we. You like dying? You condemn me to hell? Monster. Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt, Stephen Ray, Antonio Banderas, Kirsten Dunst, and Christian Slater. Interview with the Vampire. Hi, Bubba. Oh, you want to say hi? Say hi guest. to Mr. Gene. Hi. Hello. Hi. Say hi to Mr. Big D. Hi, cutie. Hi. Can you say, Bye. what's your name? Tell him your name. Ellie. Ellie what? Oh. Shoe fly. She's Ellie. Oh, shoe fly. Yeah. And tell him, what, what's your favorite color? Pink. And what do you want to be when you grow up? Do you want to be a doctor? Yes. What kind of doctor, though? White. A white doctor? Yeah, that's okay. a good, that's, that's smart. Good. That is not what better. she wants to be. Do you want to be a, a pig doctor still? Dr. Kimball. Yes. And what sounds, hey, tell him real quick, what sound, is an, what sound does an eagle make? Uh, uh. <laughs> It's pretty accurate. That is really good. Yeah.